So welcome back to Outdoors with the Morgans. Today's video is gonna be completely different than anything you have ever seen on our channel before. And there's two reasons that we're doing this video. Number one, a lot of people have asked for more information on the subject. And number two, I appreciate and respect anyone who is good at what they do. And the guy that we're gonna interview today is absolutely fantastic at what he does. So here we are with uh, Dr. Friedlander and we have Eva and Melissa. We had, when did you have surgery? January 4th, Eva? January 4th. Dr. Friedlander, how long have you been doing surgeries for Chiari malformation? So the training in neurosurgery is uh, seven years long. And I graduated medical school in 91, so between 91 and 98, I would have done some Chiari operations during my training. I started working at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston in 98 and stayed there for 12 years. So I did a good number of Chiari operations. It was one of my specialties um, on top of many other uh, surgeries that I do. And when I came here in 2010, uh, that uh, number of operations for Chiari kind of increased. Uh, more and more patients uh, came by and uh, we ended up uh, providing opinions, second opinions, third opinions. Uh, sometimes doing reoperations from somewhere else, and people come here uh, for that. So I'm pretty busy looking at Chiari patients now. What is special and different about Chiari is that a lot of the things that we do are you look at an x ray, and the x ray is really the most important part. And then there's some symptoms, there may or may not be symptoms associated with it, and then you go and you discuss with the patient, uh, is it appropriate to do the operation, discuss the risk and benefits, and then go from there. What, where Chiari is different is that part of it is the x-ray. It's, it's an important part, but a more important part is, is the patient. What are the symptoms? What are the, uh, what kind of headaches they have? Where's the numbness? Where's their memory problems? So it's really something where I can't tell you how many operations I've done for care, let's say 500 throughout my career. Every 50 that I do, I get better. And when I get better, I mean I understand it better. Uh, I've modified my operations in different ways so mm -hmm. people, you know, more and more patients are going home post-op day one, post-op day two versus when I started, as well as in many other places, go home post-op day five or post-op day six. So the, the more that you do, as, as you would expect, the better uh, you get. But it's not only the understanding the imaging and the operation, but it's the decision. Who do you operate? Who do you not operate on? Right. Can you briefly explain exactly what Chiari is? We have in some videos in the past. Obviously, you can explain it a little bit better. But briefly explain what it is exactly. So there, there are different parts of the brain. There's the... Uh, the, it's actually called the brain, the, the, the top part. The bottom is the cerebellum, which is in, in the back of, of the head here. I could bring my friend here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and he's COVID uh, protected. He's got his pet pit <laughs> mask, <laughs> which uh, your sister gave to me. <laughs> he died of not, not, not the COVID, the pit <laughs> mask. <laughs> uh, so in, if, if you can open here the, the top, so, so the the brain would be obviously in the top here. The cerebellum is on the back part, and this large opening called the foramen magnum, under normal circumstances, the spinal cord should be going through there, so only the spinal cord. And what happens in Chiari is that the cerebellum herniates down through that little opening, so that opening doesn't change in size, but if you have the spinal cord and the cerebellum pressing on it, then that's, that's what the Chiari malformation is. Now, the symptoms that come with it are a number. The, the most common one is the headache, particularly when people cough or sneeze or, or strain, often in the back of the head. It doesn't always have to be there, but off, most often it is. And the reason that happens is that every time you cough or sneeze, everything kind of comes down a little bit, gets pushed down. So it, once it gets pushed down, then there's pressure that comes up. There's the fluid of the brain that circulates through that, that area. And when it gets crowded and there isn't enough space for the fluid to flow through, the pressure on the brain builds up and that's why you get the headache when you cough or sneeze or, or strain right. is, is an example. So that's the most common symptom. 
other symptoms which patients have. I would say the second most common would be numbness and tingling in the hands and the feet. Uh, and then beyond that, and this is where experience comes in, there are lots of other symptoms that patients come up with. One is ringing in the ears. And you say, why would that cause ringing in the ears? Because if that area is so crowded mm -hmm. that every time your heart beats, the fluid of the brain flows. It's pulsatile, the fluid of the brain also. Because it's crowded, it makes a noise. Or, or whatever, and that's what people hear. Huh. And I first noticed that when we had a good number of patients that would say, I had ring in my ears, oh, my ring has gone away. And you know, I, hmm. I never really expected that until I started hearing it over and over again. That's a symptom. Another one, which we're doing quite a bit of research in right now, is memory problems. You figure if you have high pressure in your brain, your brain's not going to work as well. Right. And we have so many patients that come in with brain fog. And it was one of those things as well that they came in with brain fog, and they so many use that that word brain fog. That and then after surgery, brain fog is gone. So then we started doing uh, research on it. We have our neuropsychologist that evaluates not all my carry patients, but the carry patients that complain of memory problems, brain fog. So we do a before and we do an after, and we're putting all that together, we're writing it up, and the results are really interesting. A lot of patients get better uh, after that. So again, it's, it's one of those symptoms which, if you read the textbooks, they're not going to be there. But by doing so many of them and hearing it over and over again, and paying attention, obviously, um, you come up with, with an additional symptom. So that's another symptom of Chiari. Another one could be blurry vision. Uh, a lot of the nerves that control the movement of the eyes go right through that area that's compressed or within that neighborhood or there's high pressure there uh, that we once you fix it the blurry vision goes away but what I tell patients is here are some symptoms which are typical and these are the ones that I think are going to get better the other ones I don't know if they're going to get better or not but I tell them is a joke which is not so much of a joke because if it gets better, I'll take full credit for it. If it doesn't, <laughs> I said, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I don't have a better way of saying it, rather than I just don't know which is going to get right. better or not. It's different. Chiari is different than, obviously, if somebody has a brain tumor, I said, okay, here's the brain tumor. It's going to cause X, Y, or Z. It might kill you, and we have to do that. It's, it's a very different, and sure, uh, Chiari is not plastic surgery, but it's, it's, but it's a different kind of reason to do it. And one of the other operations I do many of are, are aneurysms. So aneurysms, a lot of them are found by chance hmm. when they're unruptured. So if they're found by chance, then I have to go and really discuss with the patient. This aneurysm is not causing you any problems. If it ruptures, 50% of them are going to die. So how do you weigh the, what's the likelihood of rupture, what's the risk and benefit of the procedure? So each one of the different pathologies have a different discussion, a different rationale as to what to do. And, and why to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, Eva, one of your, uh, Eva obviously had really bad headaches, and, uh, but she mentioned the other day, not only are the headaches gone, but the pressure. She was always talking about pressure in her head, and that has been relieved as well, right? Yeah, I definitely had a lot of pressure in the back of my head, and I would have headaches daily, like multiple times a day. And then I also had the numbness and tingling in my hands and feet. Right. So, could you explain exactly what you did for Eva? So, um, the operation for Eva was, was a, a pretty standard one for a Chiari. Um, you know, the patient comes to the operating room, gets intubated, general anesthesia. You get flipped on your belly. There's all padded. There's a, a, a number of gel rolls that are there just to make sure there's no there are no pressure points. The head is he held in fixation. We have what's called a Mayfield head fixation device, where we we'll go and we'll put the head in, in this. Uh, like screws that really go up to the skull, so you, you don't want to move your head. Obviously, you're going to be a, you, are, you are asleep during. during she knew during that because the, there's something yeah. stuck to her hair. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, she yeah. Said. So that's that's there. Uh, I try to shave as little hair as needed. Uh, so we, we shave just a little strip of hair like this. And has your hair grown? Well, you probably can't tell with all your long there's hair. There's not even much gone. Yeah, yeah. So we shave. Well, 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 why don't you show where where you were shaved? Yeah, yeah there's hardly any. <laughs> Yeah, so that's all that was shaved, and uh, yeah, her incision definitely healed faster than my finger has. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something? 
But yeah, that's all there was to it there. This is, uh, this is incredible to us because our older daughter, Hannah, had this surgery. And her incision, well, this was mu shaved, all like a path through here. And her incision was probably 10 inches long. Yeah. 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 This is just this right. picture. Was Going back to, to the operation, so again, the patient is facing down, uh, making sure everything is padded. The, there's an incision that goes from about this area here, this is called the inion. There's like a little bump that you have in the back yeah. of your head, so it starts just below there. And yeah, I, even to me, I, I, I try to make it like a few millimeters smaller every time, so just wow. you can see how much you need. So you start from there and you go straight, straight down. You want it, there are a lot of muscles here, so you open up the muscles to, to expose this part of the skull. There's the the first vertebra, this is what's called the first, the arch of C1, the first uh, vertebra there that we expose. And with most of the patients, we take off the arch of C1. But uh, l let me go back on, on the operation. So the operation, actually, you make a, we have a, a special drill. We make a hole here and a hole here. The brain is covered by what's called the dura, the coverings of the brain. So we have a little instrument that we dissect under the bone, mm -hmm. and we have a drill that we open an area like, like this up. And now the key part of the operation and one that I pay very close attention to, some people just open this part here. I open this part here, but really go deep in there. because That actually is one of the most important parts of the operation. The problem is that there's not enough room here. So you want to give enough room there. So I, I'm very careful in terms of opening the bone all the way down there to give it room. Now, with Eva, actually she had, there was a large, because you're tall and you have a long neck, there was a, there was a large space between the bone here and the C1. Actually, I did not touch your C1 because there was just, pl I didn't need to, there was plenty okay. of space there. And once we have that bone off, you open the coverings of the brain, you open it all up, and then you, you're seeing the tonsils, tonsils, which are the bottom part of the cerebellum, which is what's herniated down there. Often in patients with Chiari, because that area's been compressed for so long, there's a lot of scarring. So with a microscope, with a very uh, you know, high uh, magnification microscope, we go in and we, we dissect all those, uh, those what are called arachnoidal adhesions, all those adhesions which are just holding the tonsils there, and you open them up. And once we open them up, we always see like a whole bunch of CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid of the brain that is up in the top that just drains down because it was being backed up there. Yeah. And we, we go into what's called the fourth ventricle. That's the area of the brain that's, that has this CSF, which was being occluded by the tonsils. And once we open it up, you can start to see it all there. A lot of times, that's all that's needed. But since I'm there already, the tonsils are, you don't need your tonsils. You, you, you right. wouldn't know if, if you take them out. Uh, it's kind of like the appendix, uh, or your <coughs> real tonsils, I guess a lot right. of times you, you don't need them. So what I do is we, we, we cauterize them and shrink them. So then the, there's even more space in, in that area. So we shrink them enough, then we put a patch over it, sew it up, it has to be what's called watertight closure because you don't want the fluid of the brain to leak through there. Mm -hmm. Then we close it in layers. Um, some of the things that we've been doing is I put a lot of numbing medicine. So at, at least for the first 12 hours, there's less pain just from the, from the muscle. Uh, patients are on steroids to, to decrease the inflammation. Uh, we also started a, a medication called ketamine that most of my patients get, which also decreases the pain sensation. So you get the ketamine overnight, and that's how we're discharging patients day one or day two. It's about 50-50, uh, but more and more we're discharging them uh, on day one. Uh, patients also, because of COVID, want to leave the hospital. Yeah. Uh, so patients also are a little more incented uh, uh, to, to leave the hospital. Obviously, the food at home hopefully is better than the food yeah, here. Yeah, right. Uh, so people want to. Uh, the want cafeteria to was pretty good, actually. Actually, uh. we enjoyed the cafeteria. <laughs> um, I think Eva would have left on day one, but that anesthesia made her nauseous. Yeah. And so, yeah. Sur surgeons always love to blame anesthesia. So oh, she's never had it, and like, yeah, even the PT, he came in and he's like, you got to get up, you got to walk the hallway. And she's yeah. like, yeah, I'm kind of nauseous. He goes, you'll feel better if you get up. So she gets up, she walks the hallway, turns around, and the assistant with her said, how do you feel? And Eva goes, I feel nauseous. And they're like, you'll feel better. She gets back to her room, and he goes, don't you feel better? She goes, no, I feel like I have to throw up. And she pulled her mask down and, <laughs> and threw up just looking at him. I'm like, 
Oh, that was exciting. So, so that, that's a part of the anesthesia, but also that fourth ventricle I was talking about. Yeah. It's very, very delicate, and, and, um, and it gets inflamed with any little bit of blood or just the surgery itself. So people react differently. I see. Yeah. So do you have some questions for Eva? So Eva, <laughs> how are I get my daughter's name also Eva. Uh, <laughs> awesome. But uh, so how how are you doing? Much better than I thought, especially like the first week. Just like seeing how Hannah was, I thought I'd be like awful and in a ton of pain. But the pain really wasn't that bad. Like the worst part was being nauseous, right? And that's like saying a lot, I think. But and I feel much better. You FaceTimed Hannah that night. Yeah, the night af of my surgery, I FaceTimed Hannah, and I was able to like move my neck, like she almost all the way. It, yeah. And Hannah couldn't believe it. Yeah. So, like let's, so let's go over your symptoms before surgery. Did, yeah. did you always have headaches? The past, mm. it just like continued to get worse almost. But for the past like two years, mm -hmm. probably, I've had headaches, and then like the longer it went on, the more frequent and the worse they got. And if you think way way back, did you always have those same kind of headaches, just they got worse, or are these are the quality of the headaches were totally different? I. Uh, if you can remember. I'm not starting, starting to just sure, impede your daily life. Like she said yeah. to me, crying one day, she goes, "I just can't imagine living the rest of my life like this." And that's why I thought. <laughs> As a mom, I'm like, okay, we have to do something because that was really heart-wrenching to hear her say that. She I was planning her activities, like coming home from school. She coaches at a gym for, for younger kids. She would lie down before she went to coach, and then she'd go coach. She'd come and do homework, but she'd li you know, she had to plan when she could lie down just to rest for a little bit. So, were the, so your other daughter also had QR, right? Yeah. The, the, were the symptoms similar? Hers were her hands and her feet. More so, yeah. And Still I had headaches. Getting ready for um, Morgan was with Hannah. I remember that. And uh, they, we were getting ready for a Fourth of July party, and we were putting up tables and all these decorations and everything. And we look over, and Hannah's sitting down, and we're like, "Get moving! We have a lot to do." Like all of her cousins were there helping, and there's Hannah sitting. She goes, "Mom, my feet are killing me. My hands." And, and this was just going on, and it got pretty bad. Where we went and saw. Um, it took a while to figure it out though. Yeah, we saw others. They did testing for MS and ruled that out. So we kind of went in the back door of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, it got bad enough that same thing she knew she had to have. All right, so you had the headaches. Mm -hmm. You have also numbness and tingling in your hands? Yeah. How about your feet? Yeah, I had it in my feet probably more than my hands. Okay, were there any other symptoms now that you look back at it? Just like the pressure in my head. So the pressure in the yeah. head. And when you woke up, uh, obviously it's a lot of medicines and you're nauseous, but what was the first thing that you noticed that was different? I, I would almost wake up like every day before the surgery, like with a headache or like just the pressure. And whenever, I, like the day after surgery, when I woke up, I didn't have like any of that. And I haven't had anything since. How about the numbness and tingling? Yeah, I haven't experienced that either. Yeah, yeah so that's one of the first things that patients know, because it's very easy to say numbness and tingling that's one thing, but sure, you've just had big surgery and there's mm -hmm. pain and how do yeah. you put them all together? And a lot of patients, you know, if the numbness and tingling, if they had it, it's gone, that's always a, a really good sign. And then, you know, the pressure in the head. And, and, and oh, she those. just feels good. She looks good. She feels good. She just... She's a little more sarcastic, though. Yeah. I will say that. I don't know if that's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's anything. It sounds like it runs in the family. When did you decide you wanted to be a neurosurgeon? So if we go back a little, when did I decide to be a doctor? I'll start with, with that. That's a good idea. So I think about... 15 or 20 minutes after I was born, my mother told me, you're going to be a doctor. <laughs> so I, I don't remember ever deciding not to be a doctor. I was, that, that was what I was going to be, a doctor. Wow. Uh, my mother's, both of her brothers are physicians. So that was a little bit in the family, or quite a bit in, in the family. So I always knew I was going to be a doctor. And when I was, I was born and raised in Venezuela. When I was there, I knew I was very interested in doing medicine at the highest level, and I knew the U.S. was the place to be. I'm also, I was also very interested in doing biomedical research. To me, that's something I wanted to do. I was, was very interested actually in cancer research. That's what I wanted to do, and I knew I had to come to the U.S. Uh, to do that. So when I started 
medical school, I, was, I thought I was going to be a pediatric hematologist oncologist, so dealing with kids with tumors. Those would have been a, a great combination of yeah. everything that I want and did. So during medical school, the first two years is mostly in the classrooms, and then third and fourth is in the hospital. So during first and second year, nothing changed in terms of my interest. Third year comes around, and I did my first rotation. It was uh, radiology. That was interesting, but it's not what I wanted to do. Then I did OBGYN, which is actually pretty cool, delivering babies, and that was, that was mm -hmm. fun. And I liked the surgery part, and I thought that was interesting, but probably not what I wanted to do. And then after that, I did pediatrics. So that, to me, that was the big rotation I had to do well because that's what I wanted to do. And I'll never forget, there was a young girl, she's about 12 years old, she had an immunodeficiency, not, not HIV. And uh, she had a, a fungus growing in her lungs. So it's called pulmonary aspergillosis. And one day I was rounding on her, and the, asperg the aspergillus, the fungus, kind of grew into, into one of the main arteries. She started coughing up bright red blood, and she died. It was it was horrible. Oh and my parents were there, and I got pretty close with them because I was the student, that was the patient I was following. And emotionally, that was rough. That was really rough. And I said, "Is this what I want to do? It's watching kids die?" Yeah. Um, and I just decided that was just not what I wanted to do. And then I had to think of, okay, what am I going to do? And one of my good friends, he was, there, there's some people that go into neurosurgery that, again, from when they're born, they know they want to be a brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my very close friends that, uh, that that was his desire. So he at least put the bug of neurosurgery in my head. So when I explored it, I did surgery afterwards, I really liked it. And this is back, so I graduated medical school in 91. Back then, you probably heard in the media, you know, the 80 hour work week, the residents can't work more than 80 hours. Well, back then, that did not exist. Didn't exist. So, so I was working. So one of the reasons I wasn't interested in surgery, is I thought the training is so long, there are surgery seven years, I'm going to be working 120 hours a week. I said, no way. And I remember talking to, he's passed away since Dr. McCabe, who was the, he was the head of the surgery clerkship uh, where, I, where I did my surgery. And I said, I have this dilemma. I, I think I like surgery, but you know, training is so long and it's so hard. And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, Robert, you can do, let's say dermatology, just to say one thing. And you could do dermatology, and if you like it, God bless you. You're gonna, be, you're gonna get to work at nine, come home at five, everything's gonna be happy, and people are not gonna die, whatever. And it's, or, but if it's not what you like, you're gonna wake up mad, you're going to be mad at work and scream at everybody and come home and you're going to beat up your family and your wife whatever, because you're so angry at everything. But if you like it, great. If you love surgery, you're going to be working hard. But it, if you love it, you love it. And that's what you're going to do. And that's what you're going to be the happiest with. And sure, with our training, we got to the hospital at 3 a.m. And we'd, sometimes we stayed there three days in a row and operated on and on and on and on. And, and, but I, I loved it. And there was just no other thing I wanted to do and that, that conversation actually to yeah. me changed me because I said you know what sure seven years is a long time but it's a defined time and then you have another 30 years after that to do what you love and what you like and what you want uh, it takes away part of your youth for sure I was, mm -hmm. I was between uh, I was between 21 and 32 that's that's where I was and my friends yeah. were were doing other things for their mm -hmm. life but yeah I wouldn't change it a bit for what I did and um, what a great story. Yeah. It, it really okay. is. What do you like to do uh, when you're not working here? So I uh, have uh, three kids um, and a wife. <laughs> yeah, so I try to spend as much time as, as I can uh, with them. They're, uh, the two older ones are out to college uh, now, so that's, uh, you know, we talk as much as, uh, as we can. The little one, Eva, she's, uh, she's 12 and, uh, you know, keeps us young and uh, so a lot of the free time is with them and yeah, we love to travel, love scuba diving, just going, going and I, mean, I always say, not, not, don't really mean it, but sort of like I always loved to, would have been great to be an astronaut, okay. but I know I'm never going to do that, but scuba diving is kind of like the second best yeah. like that because you go, you're floating and you're seeing the fish and the fish are looking at you and it's just, it's really right. cool, it's also a nice thing to do with the kids. So uh, my wife is Greek, so we, we really like going to Greece. Very nice. So traveling, being with uh, 
friends and family, my parents and my brother and sister live in Florida, so we'll go see them as much as we can. Obviously, COVID's uh, complicated things a little bit. By the way, it is COVID, but we're six feet apart, everybody. Yes. We're keeping safety Stretch first, out. and right. everybody's been tested and all the good things. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So what exactly do you do here? So that's a great question. I sometimes wonder myself. <laughs> um, I, I'm the chairman of neurosurgery at the University of Pittsburgh and, and UPMC. It's the largest academic department of neurosurgery in the country by far, um, at least by a factor of two. We have uh, 14 hospitals that we do neurosurgery. We're doing close to 10,000 operations a, a year. And as I said, that's about the d double what the next largest uh, uh, hospital uh, or neurosurgery department uh, is. Within our department, one of the things I'm really, really proud of is our neurosurgeons. As, as I told you at the beginning, you know, I'm subspecialized and I've done so many of the Chiari surgeries. And I do aneurysms, I do what's called cavernous mal malformations, and so I, I, I do a certain number of things or other things that if patients come to me as an example, I'll refer them to one of my colleagues who's a world specialist and this other, uh, uh, whatever other disease. So we have a number of uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jorge Gonzalez Martinez is an example. He's kind of the world's top epilepsy and functional neurosurgeon. What a, I mean, just an amazing doctor. Dr. Paul Gardner does a uh, really pioneered surgery through the nose. Um, Dr. George Zinner knows his partner. And again, just gifted surgeons that do certain kinds of things. Uh, Dr. Dade Lunsford, who was a former chairman of uh, the department, he was the first person to bring Gamma Knife, uh, which many people have heard, Gamma Knife into the United States. And he's published so many papers on it, really advancing uh, the field. Uh, our spine surgeons, Dr. Kojo Hamilton, David Oconquo, uh, really doing, uh, Peter Gerson, doing phenomenal spine surgery uh, as well. A pediatric uh, uh, group, uh, uh, Ian Pollock, Stephanie Green, uh, Rob Kellogg. Uh, Taylor Abel as examples. These are people that are all sub sub specialized. Our, our, our brain tumor doctors, Pascal Zinn, uh, 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 Khalil Abdullah, somebody who just uh, recruited. Again, amazing surgeons that really sub specialize and become really, really good at, at, at what they do. So um, I'm so proud of them because of how we help people. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we're here for. Very nice. We, we listened to a podcast a couple months ago. Um, it was uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. was on uh, Joe Rogan's show getting interviewed, and he talked about his concussions and how he... I think he was, came to Pittsburgh to yeah, be treated. He came here, and uh, he said the same thing. He did the research, and there was nowhere else that, that would be suitable for him yeah. to come yeah, here. Yeah, so, so we have a, a, a large concussion center, Yeah. Um, and Mickey Collins is... Uh, leads that, uh, okay. that that center and people come from all over the world yeah uh, they work very closely with dr. Maroon dr. Joe Maroon okay. uh, who's a member of our department uh, uh, worked with the Steelers for many many years as, as their neurosurgeon uh, he developed what's called the impact testing platform mm -hmm. uh, which they're testing I don't want to say millions it might be millions of kids now and, wow. and athletes um, wow. just having a before so you have a baseline you have a before and an after so a lot of really wonderful things that have happened here. The chairman before Dr. Lunsford, Dr. Peter Janetta, who was the founder of the <laughs> academic department, he developed a, a surgery called microvascular decompression for patients with, for example, trigeminal neuralgia or hemifacial spasm. Trigeminal neuralgia is horrible pain in the face. They call it a suicide disease. Also oh my. Because it, it's such horrible pain. He essentially invented this operation and people still come from all over the world wow. here for that. Mm. That's incredible. On a different note, I, uh, I heard you're getting some advice from my nephew Christian on uh, the pumpkin growing. A lot of our viewers watched, they were fascinated by Christian's giant pumpkin, but you're kind of into that as well, aren't you? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this story because it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> story. Uh, a number of years ago, three years ago, in my backyard, all of a sudden a plant starts to grow. I didn't plant anything there. And it's, it looked interesting. And I remember I was in California with, with my wife and the youngest daughter, Eva, and we go to an area where they have, they're planting vegetables. And there was a pumpkin plant there. And Eva goes, oh, that's the same plant we have at home. I went, okay, come on, Eva. And then it, it, it was. We went back home, and it was, it was the same. And you got the beautiful orange flowers that started coming up. And, and, but we did nothing with it. 
I just I would water it once in a while, and we had about 31 little pumpkins, about like this, that came out of that plant, and that was great. But you know, North Surgeons were competitive. I don't want a little pumpkin. I want a, I want a big <laughs> pumpkin. So I go online, I go on the internet, and I look giant pumpkin seeds, and I find some seeds, and I go and I planted them, and I made some progress. I ended up with a pumpkin uh, a little bigger than this, but uh, about this size. And then I figure for the following year, because I, uh, I am just so nice, and I want to be so nice with everybody, I took the seeds from that pumpkin, and I started giving it to other people. <laughs> and. And I was just proud of how, what a nice person I, I, <laughs> I am, that was. So I gave your sister there, Stacy, uh, some pumpkins because she was going to give it to her son. So, so for about the next few months, I thought, He's wor we're working with the same seeds, okay? And I end up with my pumpkin, my plants just, mm, you know, going as fast as I can. And then but by the time like my, my plant was like this, all of a sudden there's pictures of like, like, like a pumpkin already like, like that. And, you know, I, I was always, I don't know, 20 pounds behind. And, 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 and I always thought it was from the same... same and I was like, Jesus. And, 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 then, and then I would, I would get advice from, from Christian. And he would tell me what to do or not to do. He would actually send me the, oh, my phosphorus and the magnesium and the two, whatever, and all the compost and all the different things. But I was always fairly behind him and you know at the end of the actually in your video of him that's why I figured out he had that was my mistake he had, different, he had different he had different seats yeah. right. <laughs> but I, I'm not sure that was the whole part of it but that, that, that was a part that was part of it he had different seats but he also had all the awesome. all the right things to do and that so he ended up with his you know five thousand pounds <laughs> ended up with my that was not bad but it, no. Well, there's I'm always next year. Surgeon, uh, <laughs> planting pumpkins, but now uh, Stacy was very and, and Chris were very nice, and uh, I got uh, for Christmas uh, the real pumpkin seeds. I got uh, the, uh, from pumpkins that are 1,100 pounds, and and all the different wow. accoutrements and different things. <laughs> yeah. And so so, so we'll see what happens next year. All right. Yeah. yeah. Real so let's predict that Dr. Friedlander will be. Going down the Monongahela and his pumpkin. Yeah, Christian actually had his in the, uh, he floated it in the pond. Yeah, yeah he floated it. <laughs> With a captain's hat. Yeah. I, I, I think his is always going to be larger, but, <laughs> but, but you know, I'll, I'll give it, a, at least if we have the same starting seed. That's right. We right. have a chance oh, yeah. of getting there. So that was fun. <laughs> well, well, thanks for uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, thanks for taking the time today. We really, really appreciate it. Appreciate everything you did, and uh, this is all just fascinating to me. I'll be honest. If I would have known everything that goes into that surgery before Eva had it, I probably wouldn't have felt as good about the surgery. But it's remarkable it's what you're able to do, and her to be able to recover as quickly as she did. It's just, uh, it's amazing. We're very thankful for that. Yes, well, I'm, thank you. I'm glad that you're feeling as we well as you, you are. We some, some merch. <laughs> <laughs> so just some coffee mugs and a oh. Morgan's and this is the famous tumbler people will just be so frustrated that we have them and they can't get them but we're getting them and then this is our, one of our most popular shirts alright so. I love it excellent thank you and this is a small I don't know if this will work for your wife or maybe for um your daughter Eva. But this is a Sasquatch, and uh, believe in yourself, we put on it, and that's another. Pretty cool, thank you. Is that a question? It's his walk. He should have a big bandage on something. <laughs> yeah. He gets hurt. Well, we really, really appreciate you and uh, what you did for our daughter. We really do. It has yeah. uh, changed her life, which uh, it's just it's wonderful. And I uh, appreciate all the hard work you put in all those years to get to that point and how this all, we won't get into that, but how this all came together with uh, my sister getting the appointment with you and it was just one right after another bang 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 and here we are a short time later and he was feeling great and we well, really appreciate it well i'm thrilled you're doing as well as uh, as you are yeah uh, uh, we'll keep in touch and i just obviously uh, very happy yeah there we thank go. you <laughs>
So before I wrap this video up, I want to thank Dr. Friedlander for taking time out of his schedule to film this video. I thought it was very interesting, very informative, and like I said at the beginning of this video, I appreciate anyone who is very good at what they do. It doesn't matter what they do, as long as they're passionate about what they do and they're good at it, they have my utmost respect, and he is one of those guys. If you want more information on him, there are several links in the description. Please check it out. And I think this would be a good video to share with your friends and family, especially if you have anyone or know of anyone that may be experiencing symptoms like our daughter Eva was. But I think that's it. Like I always say, if you enjoy these videos, please hit the like button, click subscribe, and share them with your friends. Thanks.